let me show you Africa as an entrepreneur. Africa is a fundamental part of the global economy. Uh, there's a way the world does business and there's a way we do business. When we put our faith and our trust in God, he's the master strategist and always directs our path. So it's a vibrant, young market with lots of energy. Along with our diverse cultures, provide us with rich insights into God and his creativity. There are people building businesses. So come, come see that out. One of the greatest parts about Nairobi is that you can see lions, giraffes, zebras, and a skyline all from one vantage point. I love this city and I love Kenya as a whole, just as I am sure you love the area God has placed you in. It's no coincidence that you live where you live or came from a certain place. God knew what he was doing when he put you there. And there's something about our homes that we take with us wherever we go. And sometimes our homes call us back. That's the situation for many entrepreneurs on the continent. Some go off to school somewhere else, but return to contribute to the new narratives being formed in our cities or in our countries. Together, we contribute to the flourishing of these areas through our work. That's the story with this next video. We'll see how one business leader used his gifts to empower emerging innovators with resources he wasn't afforded while growing up. Let's check it out. Most people think that a Christian business is one where you have Bible studies and prayer meetings and also one where you tithe. A Christian business is where the goods and services actually offer a redemptive purpose. So the marketplace is a place where you see Jesus in action. My name is Dennis Tongoi, and I'm the executive director of Root to Fruit, which is a consultancy working with business leaders, helping them align their culture to purpose. Although we lived in one of the most affluent neighborhoods in uh, Nairobi, I went to school in one of the most poor, poorest parts of the city, a place called Stare, and we had actually one of the slums there called Majengo, and actually have lunch, sometimes going through the brothels to get my lunch, and uh, buy some food, and in the evening I'll be dining with the kings. So in my mind, I never learned to distinguish people because of their uh, economic status. I see all human beings as human beings. My name is Irene Tongoi. I was born one of 25 children. Um, my mother was a second wife, and uh, I grew up in a village far away from Nairobi, the city, and I um, started working with the Lord when I was 17. And when I was 19, going 20, I, I chose, I told the Lord, would you use me to just touch one life and change just one life? And the story began from that a prayer, very simple prayer of commitment to serve. Now, all of us who are followers of Christ are given a calling. There are those who are called to the pulpit ministry, those who are called the market ministry, they're both called. So they're both ministers. Dennis and I had become members of a new church that was being planted. Uh, members of this community where we are began to attend. And this community is at the bottom of the pyramid, totally, completely different from the neighbors that live in this wealthy Runda estate. But they were coming to our church and I was so conflicted. Like We were meant to go and evangelize among the well-to-do and now we have all these people that stream here every week. I'm like, no, let's not do anything for these people. They are coming to spoil our church. If we don't just pay attention to them, they'll go away. Well, they didn't. Shame on me, because the Lord loves all his people. 
I listen to the women describe the situation, their children that should have gone to high school but couldn't because of poverty. I sense the Holy Spirit telling me, what do you have that I can use, which is a degree in education, which I had not used. Oh, Eileen is an angel sent to us by God. You know she's a mother, that motherly heart. When she comes, even when you are crying and she has nothing to give you, her voice only is enough to make you whole. So we started this school in 2006. Say maybe up to 400, 500 boys and girls have gone through here up till now. Who Some have gone into university, into colleges and uh, have started lives, um, it's amazing. Before the school, none of us had hope. Even we were feeling how our children would grow, our brothers and sisters, so to speak. You see, when people's needs are met, they're open to hearing what else it is you have to offer. Mm. So business becomes a very strategic domain to reflect the character of Christ to a world that is watching. I've been involved in agribusiness for quite you know, many years now, and one of the products we're doing, actually I developed it with my daughter. When she was breastfeeding, she'd look on the internet for products that could help her, and most of the products that she found helpful were from China using natural elements that are here in Kenya. We have neem, we have tea tree oil, we've got uh, aloe vera. So we developed this product, and then I got quite surprised when every week, including today, there's a customer who buys about 25 to 50 bottles a week. And then I discovered that their primary users are actually prostitutes in a red light district. And they love the product. And so um, I was in a dilemma, do I keep doing it? And then it occurred to me that Jesus did meet the needs of the most vulnerable, but we now have a bridge into that community because there's a product they're using that actually meets their need. So business is, has always been part of every society. It's not a new thing. Um, I think when we look at it now as a redemptive purpose, it's, it's saying, is there more that business can do than just make money? Business and mission go together. Paul was a tent maker. And in fact, at the end of the book of Rome, when he appeals to Caesar, when he's under trial, he stays in his own rented home, paying for his stay there because he wasn't raising money to do mission, but it allowed him to use that platform to proclaim the gospel freely. So mission has always been driven on the back of business because business provides resources in sustainable manners. Our first African bishop of the Church of England was actually from West Africa. He observed that because of the uh, Emancipation Act, a lot of slave ships were being put up for sale. So he and his congregation bought those slave ships and began to use them for trade. Um, when the missionaries came in from Europe, they observed this trade. Um, the biggest challenge was that the primary commodities that were selling fastest was actually whiskey. So a lot of whiskey being brought in from Europe um, into Africa. So they basically stopped that trade because again, the dualistic mindset felt you can't be a bishop and be doing trade. So that dualistic mindset has actually caused a silo thinking that if you are a business person, you can't be a good Christian. If you're a good Christian, you can't be a business person because the two are seen to be in opposition. Wow. Dennis is very intense. Once he believes in something, once he understands it's God's will for him, he gives it his all. I would say that failure has probably been my biggest stepping stone towards impacting people's lives. Because you can give a 10 steps to success, but most of us are living in a painful world where failure is a reality. I mean, even currently right now, even with the project we're looking at, I'm still paying off debt because I was trying to raise money to scale it up. COVID came in and the, and the funding went away, but I committed myself. People come and ask me, why are you different from me? Because you're going through the same flood, but why is your boat floating? Why is your heart different from mine? Because my hope is in Christ. So business is a very good platform to actually express your values and your character where people can actually see 
especially when the pressure is on, how do you live out your values? If you look at the life of Jesus, he did, then taught. He raised Lazarus, then said, I'm the resurrection and the life. There's no debate, you know? He fed the 5,000, then said, I'm the bread and the living bread. But after doing it, it becomes very difficult to debate it. You can talk about discipleship, but disciples are made in the family and in the marketplace because they observe what you do, not what you say. So to me, one, what business does, it provides the dignity and it provides an option and a pathway into a prepared future. When people are employed and they are actually working and um, sweating and providing for themselves, there's pride. Um, that, that speaks to something about what our humanity. The staff that work with me, they just find it so fulfilling. They love working with children, investing in their lives, and they're paid a salary and they want to be there forever, literally, you know. So it's so satisfying for me to watch that. Thinking of oneself as part of an ever-growing opportunity to serve allows you to draw other people, not to compete with you, but collaborate with you, because God's vision is always going to be bigger than anything you can do individually. It's not how many Christians we have, what kind of Christians are we? And are we the kind of people who change culture, mm. or are the kind of people who are accommodated and are by the culture? So it's not putting marbles into a jar of water, it's putting a drop of ink into a bottle of water, so it changes everything. Just yesterday, I was training some government officials from Uganda to begin to see how they can begin to see the industries flourish within the pharmaceutical uh, sector. It's a mindset of blessing other people rather than extracting from other people. So business's mission to me is recognizing the gift of business as a calling and then enabling people who are gifted as entrepreneurs to actually see their calling as part of God's serving service in meeting people's needs through creating goods, services, knowledge that bring glory and honor to God. Every entrepreneur is called to create. Sometimes we start out of necessity when we see a gap in the marketplace. Sometimes we start out with the idea of aiming for people. We see a need and it stirs something holy and mysterious within us. We believe that we are uniquely qualified to do something about it. Whether it's with a new product, service, ministry or innovation. But how do we think through that well? The venture building ecosystem group Praxis has a resource called the Redemptive Frame. It helps define and explore redemptive possibilities in an organizational setting. The Redemptive Frame overlays the three ways to work, exploitative, ethical and redemptive, with the three dimensions of strategy, operations and leadership. The exploitative way is to take all you can get, to gain any advantage, to prevail, to possess. We approach the venture with a zero-sum mentality, a scarcity mindset. I win, you lose. The motivating force behind the exploitative way is fundamentally self or tribe-centered, to win and control. We're surrounded by the exploitative way. We all fall naturally into it and are always trying to escape its effects on us. The ethical way is to do things right, to do no harm, keep the rules, play fair, solve problems and add value. We pursue a win-win result whenever possible. The motivating force behind the ethical way is to be good and to do well, which can often also be self-centered or tribe-centered. We expect the ethical of ourselves and of those around us, even if we sometimes fall short. The redemptive way is creative restoration through sacrifice, to bless others, to renew culture and give of ourselves. We pursue an I sacrifice, we win approach. The motivating force behind the redemptive way is to love and to serve. We rarely expect to encounter the redemptive, but we are changed when we do. Here, you saw an entrepreneur who could have been content with pursuing the ethical way. He could have a perfectly fine career without thinking about bettering his community, and most everyone would have agreed with him and that approach. But he pushed in further, and what he found is that God was right there waiting for him. What a beautiful picture of redemptive work. How about you? What does your call to create look like? What way are you pursuing? Is it with a bigger vision or redemptive vision? Thank you for listening and watching.
Now spend some time in your group talking about this session and how it relates to the journey you're on. Open yourselves up to learning from one another. Be open and honest with each other. What you get out of this time together will only be as rich and edifying as what you put into it. Blessings on your time.